turns out that there are six things that you should be able to do with a graph of potential energy versus position. And that's the second one. Where's the first one? There it is. So the first thing you should be able to do is determine the total mechanical energy that an object would have that is in the region of space that's represented by the graph. To do that, you always have to be given some initial piece of information. Usually you'll be given the mass of the object and something about its speed at a certain location. So at x equals negative 0.1, this thing has a speed, a velocity of zero. Sometimes you'll just be given the kinetic energy at a certain position. Um, but either way, what you need to do is figure out what the kinetic energy is at a particular location where you were given the initial information. So here, using the formula for kinetic energy equals one half mv squared, I can put in this, well, I don't even have to put in the given information. It says it's at rest. So the kinetic energy is zero at x equals negative 0.1. So how do I find the total mechanical energy? Well, total mechanical energy is always equal to potential energy plus kinetic energy added together. So you want to look at the location where the initial information was given and that location is x equals negative 0.1. So here's x equals negative 0.1. When I come up on the graph, I find out that, oh, at that location, it has one joule of potential energy. So the graph tells me it has one joule of potential energy. And then the given information tells me that at this location right here, it has zero joules of kinetic energy. So you always have to put together a potential energy from the graph and a kinetic energy that's been given, add them together, we get a total mechanical energy of one joule. So I just figured out the total mechanical energy of the object. So that leads to number two, which is recognizing that in the absence of friction, the total mechanical energy will remain constant. So we decided the total mechanical energy is one joule, and so, typically what you will do is draw that on the graph. So let me get something to draw with here. And here we are at one joule, and I'm just gonna make a horizontal line at one joule. Why is it horizontal? Because the total energy stays the same. That's the law of conservation of energy. And so that's a really important line. That's the total amount of energy that this object has. All right, so once we've done that, you might have to find the kinetic energy or the speed at any point in the graph. So in this example, let's say we want to find the kinetic energy and the speed at x equals 0.5. So how do you do that? Well, here's x equals 0.5. Oh, uh, right about there, I would say. What you need to do is go up and read the graph and see how much potential energy it has at that location. And I would estimate that it has about 0.2 joules. So the potential energy at that location is about 0.2 joules. Now what we know is it always has a total energy of one joule. That's this line right here. And we also know that total energy is equal to potential energy plus kinetic energy. So let's put it all together. Total energy is one joule. From looking at the graph, we can see that the potential energy at that location is 0.2 joules. And so the only thing we need to find is kinetic energy. It's going to be 0.8 joules. So that's why knowing the total energy is so important. If you know the total energy, you can read the potential energy at anywhere on the graph, and what's left over is the kinetic energy. And of course, you can find the speed too using the formula for kinetic energy equals 1 half uh, mv squared. So in this case, we would have 0.8 equals 1 half, and this object had a 
mass of 2. Not very good writing here. Uh, v squared. And you can solve that. I'll leave you to, uh, to, to solve that. But that's how you would do that. Okay. What else should you be able to do? You should be able to identify the range of the object's motion by finding the turning points. And so these are usually uh, you can identify on the graph just by circling these important points. And basically, they are where the potential energy graph intersects the total energy graph. See, this object in this situation has a total energy of one joule. It's never going to have more energy than one joule. So this spot right here, it can't go into this area. In order to be in this area, you have to have more energy than one joule, and it just doesn't have it. So it's not going to go any further than this. And likewise over here. This, this total energy line really represents a cap on the object's motion. It can't go anywhere beyond, anywhere above that total energy. I mean, think about it. To be at this location right here, how much energy does it need to have? It needs to have 1.5 joules, and it just doesn't have it. It has a total energy of one joule. So here's a turning point, and here's a turning point. This object's range of motion is going to be from uh, x equals negative 0.1 meters to x equals positive 0.1 meters. And I got that just by looking at the graph here, 0.1, negative 0.1. And that's it. So those are turning points. So this is a tricky one. Determine the magnitude and direction of the conservative force acting on the object at any point in the graph. Basically, here's the answer to that. The conservative force is just equal to the negative of the slope of the graph. It's equal to the negative of the slope of the graph. So in other words, let's say we want to know the force that's acting on it when it's at 0.05, which is right here. If I go up to the graph, that's 0.05 right there. And so I would have to calculate the slope. Hopefully they'd give you more information than we see right here. If you're in a situation like this, you would have to sketch a tangent line. I don't even know if I can do that with this software, but I'll give it a try. Um, I'm going to try to draw something that's at a tangent to the curve at that point. That looks fairly good, and maybe I could extend it this way. And uh, I'm not going to do it for the sake of brevity, but what you would then have to do is maybe pick two points. Pick this point right here, and uh, you could use that point right there, find what those coordinates are, calculate the slope, uh, and whatever answer you get for the slope, you would just put a negative sign in front of it. Now, you know, for example, this line right here, I'm going to get a positive answer. And I have no idea what it is. Let's say I would get a positive 5 when I calculate this slope. But since the conservative force is the negative of the slope, I have to put a negative sign in front of that. So actually, the answer here would be negative 5 if, in fact, the slope of this is 5. What that's telling us, the negative sign, is telling us the force is at this location is pointing in the negative direction. And that makes sense, right? This was a spring. And if you had a spring uh, on this side of equilibrium, the spring would be trying to pull it back toward the left. And likewise, look at the slope over here. If I were to calculate a slope over here, this area has a negative slope. But then when I put a negative sign in front of it, I'm going to get a positive answer for force. And again, that makes sense for a spring. If you stretch something to the left of equilibrium, the spring is going to pull it to the right of equilibrium. So where did this formula come from, by the way? Well. Let me show that to you real quick. Um, the definition of change in potential energy is the negative of the work done by a conservative force. And you can calculate work by integrating F dot dx. So delta u equals F dot dx. Now if you take the derivative of both sides here, you would get du equals negative f dx. And so basically, the force equals negative du dx. And that's the slope. Negative du dx is the negative slope of this graph. 
Um, but what's really important here is that it is the negative of the slope. The force is the negative of the slope. All right, last skill. Recognize where the object is in equilibrium and what kind of equilibrium. Well, equilibrium has the word equal in it. It basically means where all of the forces are balanced. Yeah, that's what the word balanced. Sorry about that. Um, in other words, when you add up the forces, they equal zero. That's what equilibrium is. So thinking about what we just learned, that force is the negative of the slope. We're looking for the spot where the slope is zero, and that's going to be any horizontal section. So this area right here, right at that location, has a slope of zero. So that's a spot where the force equals zero. That would be a point of equilibrium. And think about it. Going back to our spring example, this was where we said the spring was at its relaxed position. Zero is where the spring's at its relaxed position. That's where the spring doesn't exert any force. So it, it certainly matches our information on this particular graph. Now it turns out that there are three different types of equilibrium and you should be able to recognize all of them. One type of equilibrium is called stable equilibrium and that's what this is. And here's why. If you move this away from equilibrium, let's say I move it over here, which way does the force act on it? We already looked at that. Since this has a positive slope, but force is the negative of the slope, the force is going to pull it in a negative direction. In other words, if you move it away from equilibrium, the force wants to bring it back to equilibrium. That's very stable. If you do it on the other side, if you move it over here, this area has a negative slope. You put a negative sign in front of that, you get a positive value for force. In other words, if you move it over here, the force wants to bring it back here. So no matter which side you move it, the force tries to bring it back to equilibrium. And so that's called stable equilibrium. And we actually call this being stuck in a potential energy well. Um, you can think of this as a well here. And so our original example where the object was released from here and had a turning point at these two locations, it would just keep going back and forth and back and forth around this equilibrium position. So that's a very stable situation. So that's stable equilibrium. Now, you can have unstable equilibrium. It doesn't exist on the graph that we were just looking at, but it is possible to have a potential energy versus position graph that has a shape like this in it. So, uh, you know, you could have a dip, that's stable equilibrium. You can also have a bump, and you could also have a flat section. This doesn't necessarily represent a spring. It doesn't matter what, what it represents, but imagine uh, right up here, that's a flat spot. So that's a spot where the slope equals zero. That's a spot where the force equals zero. That's an equilibrium spot. But if you move the object a little bit over here, this area has a positive slope. When you put a negative sign in front of that, that means that the force is in that direction. So if you move this object away from equilibrium here, the force wants to move it even further away from equilibrium. Same thing over here. This section has a negative slope. When you put a negative sign in front of that, the force becomes positive. And so the force wants to move it further away from equilibrium. And something as simple as imagining a bowling ball on top of an upside down rounded bowl. You could balance a bowling ball on top of an upside down rounded bowl, but if you pushed it a little way, either direction, it would just, it would not come back to equilibrium. It would, it would move further from equilibrium. And that's unstable equilibrium. And this last section, which is supposed to be horizontal, if you put a bowling ball there and you moved it a little bit this way, or you moved it a little bit that way, um, it still is going to be in an equilibrium area. You're not going to have any force trying to push it one way or the other. Uh, so a, a flat spot for a significant period of time is known as neutral equilibrium. So I hope that helps.